All right, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Tim Raphael. I'm from the University of Western Australia, where I'm a master's student. Uh, today I'll be talking about testing and test methodologies. We'll look at some code, we'll look at some bits and pieces you can do within Xcode and with XCTest. Um, I'm trying to focus more on the methods you can use to go about testing your code. Um, as iOS developers, we're very often working in small teams, maybe even just by yourself. So testing isn't often something that's at the forefront of what we want to do. So what I'm aiming to do is to give you some methods in which you can approach those parts of your code that probably do need testing. Bits of code that you spend a lot of time and a lot of effort on and you don't want to see break or regress or cause you to pull your hair out. So a little bit more about me. Um, I'm a master's student at UWA. I'm also a network engineer. So I work for an Australia-wide ISP. Um, and I'm a technology enthusiast, so I like gadgets and flashy, shiny things. Um, these are all my various links and other. Um, I'm relatively active on Twitter. So first things first, why should we test? Um, yeah, as I said, it might not be the first thing you think about when you're writing code. You write your code. You run it, you run it in the simulator on your device. It seems to work. Great. You move on, you write the next thing. There are some, there are some other reasons. Firstly, quality apps. We all want good quality software. It makes your users happy. So when your users are happy, it normally means you can make money out of that app because you have happy users. And if we're developers and we're spending time on these apps, that's exactly what we want to do. There's another side. You want to prevent regressed behavior. You don't want to spend all this time working on a feature that works sweet. You're all happy. But then you write some other code, and that feature stops working. That's not cool. You have to go back and say, well, I just committed a 1,000 lines of code. That went and broke something. What was it? It's, it's not, not great. It's rework, and you really want to avoid it because it's not time efficient. The other thing you want to do, why you might want to test, is to find bugs systematically. The whole point-and-shoot method sometimes works. It's great if you're at DevWorld and you've got 20 friends, and you can give them your app, and you can say, here, break my app. We're really good at that, by the way. And Tim will attribute to that. Um, but you need a better way. If it's just by yourself or you have no friends, sad face, um, you need a way to find issues that could potentially hurt you down the track and before you ship the software. Project milestones. If you're writing tests against your app, you can be sure that a feature works and move on. If you've got a good plan on how you're going to implement your app, you can build the testing into that. And when you get to a certain point where you know, OK, this view works, this interaction works. This data download works. Write some tests around it to close off that part of the project and move on to the next one. It's a great way of stepping out and giving yourself self-assurance that a feature you've written is working and will continue to work. Then you can work in the other direction, test-driven development. If I get a bit of time at the end, I'll continue on this. But test-driven development is writing your tests first. You write a minimal test uh, that outlays the exact requirement of what your class or function or method needs to do. You then go and implement the code to make that test pass. It also means you write the absolute minimal amount of code needed to make that test pass, which will usually give you the simplest solution. So what to test? What parts of our code are lend themselves to being tested. Technically, you should test everything. You should be able to catch all the bugs. Unfortunately, that's not usually plausible. Actually, it's impossible. 
it's impossible to know exactly how many bugs you've got in your project. Here we've got a great little graph, bugs over time. So I'm finding bugs. So as I'm finding bugs, I have no idea how many are left. Therefore, I, I, know, I don't know how many I started with. As a developer, if you're writing the same type of apps over and over again, you could use some historical data to say, OK, I found 600 bugs in eight weeks of testing on my previous app. Maybe I could use that metric again on this other project. But I don't know about you. I've hardly written two apps that are the same. If you use the same combination of frameworks, the same view hierarchies, there's so many parts that could be different and thus throw this metric out. The other thing you can think about when finding bugs, and you've got to think of it as a risk and risk analysis. When you find a bug and you eliminate it, that's something your user might not hit. But you've, there's always a risk you've got to think about what bugs are left and what impact will that have to my users. So it's tricky to be able to find enough bugs to be sure that you've lowered the risk, but then you've got to know that there are still some in there and there is an inevitable amount of risk you're going to have to deal with at some point. Tests can help with this. Next, you should be testing the complicated stuff. Now, I'm, I've written some genius code at well past midnight with a combination of ideas and Red Bull. I've woken up in the morning and it might work, but it doesn't mean it's great, doesn't mean it's going to continually work when I continue to expand my project. So this is the kind of stuff where you're going to want to write it, get it working, throw some tests around it. So if you do something else, it doesn't break later. If you go to refactor it, you can be sure that it still does exactly what you want it to. Next, changes of state. Now, anyone with, who's done any part of computer science um, understands the idea of a state machine. Your app moves around between these stable states. Each stable state has preconditions and a postcondition either side of a transition. So a really good example of that is games. Games, the player moves from a playing or a battling or a walking or a healing state, for example. And there are transitions or animations or flows of data between those states. <coughs> Testing allows you to make sure that the transition between those states is consistent every time they happen and that the state you're moving from has the correct preconditions and the state you're moving to is correct with the correct postconditions. Um, we'll look at that a little bit later. Next, you should be looking at any frameworks that are third party or where weird stuff can happen. Anything that you don't necessarily have control of. I know I've written plenty of code where I run it, I test it, it works. I run it, I test it again, and it doesn't work. In the case of iCloud and Cordata, this is not an, un an unusual occurrence. But these are the kind of things that they're black boxes. You can be sure of what the public APIs are, but you can never know what's going on in the back end. So putting some tests around it and realizing that, yeah, OK, my Cordata, my Cordata interface is failing. It, it worked just before. I've made no changes. OK, you've suddenly pinpointed that, yeah, there's something going on here, and it's not my code. You can log a radar or look into it. Um, and lastly, you need to ensure that you're testing behaviors. You're not testing how something goes about its operation. You want to test the resulting behavior. So if you're testing a third-party framework, you shouldn't care about how it goes and transforms that data, how it goes about moving those views around. You need to, you need to check that what's presented to you via its public interfaces are correct. When you're writing your own classes, yes, you can do some private testing that way. But just realize that whenever you do any tests that rely on your implementation, you then, when you update that implementation, you need to update the tests. Otherwise, you're just going to then have failing tests, and then you go through and write them, and then they pass. Well, you've gone and rewritten the tests to suit your class. So whether that's a good thing or not, I'm still undecided. Um, I try to keep the implementation of my class as simple as possible, 
and then test the external. Because then I can be sure that when the external doesn't work, that's going to affect anything else that's talking to, I don't know, a data transformation class. If it still is able to convert to add two numbers together and the internals are a bit funky, I'm not that fast. But there are other metrics to look at to look at the internals of a class, look, your um, memory leaks and other pointers you've got missing and that kind of thing. There are other things you need to look at for testing the internal behavior. Um, this is also good for the whole regression uh, uh, and consistency testing. Um, when you're testing the public API and you see that change or a test break, you can be sure that something's definitely gone wrong. So, how to test. Here's where I get started on some of the uh, methodologies. Input space partitioning. Has anyone come across this before? All right, cool. Um, this is a cool one, actually, um, particularly when you're testing user input. I'll start with an example. So here's a file path. It's actually a directory path. And you can see that's fairly straightforward. If you ask a user for a, a, a user input that's a file directory, you want to uh, test your app with all these different combinations of file directories to see how it handles it. I know this you'd usually use some third-party library to do this. This is just hopefully a good example. That's the regex to check what a directory path looks like. And if you ask me, that's not pretty. Um, but it does tell you that this is how you could construct a file path. That doesn't help me, though, construct a bunch of random file paths that cover the whole input space of possible file path characters to see how my app reacts. I can validate them with that regex but I can't test it against how it will react. So in a file path, we've got at the beginning, you can have no character followed by a slash, a dot or a tilde for a, a relative path or a home directory path. You then have a bunch of valid characters. I, I tried to list them all out, but they don't all quite fit there. But then you've got characters separated by slashes. So. What can we do with input space testing? If we wanted to test everything, absolutely every possible combination of a file path that my app could, could respond to, that's a lot of combinations. This way, we split the characters up into three partitions. The leading characters, the slashes, and all the other valid characters. Now, as long as we test the bounds on each of these partitions, and each combination of these partitions, we can be sure that we've covered the whole input space. So for example, I might write a test that generates a thousand random file paths. I pick a random length, I pick a random number of characters, and I generate a file path. I have a random number of characters from both the uh, first leading partitions, so the dot or the tilde, so optionally with each of those three, and then a random number of characters. You're going to want to test the no character, the one character, and maybe 256 characters, whatever the maximum file length is on the system you're testing. This way, and then a number of characters separated by slashes. You don't have to go through every possible combination of files to test against this. Input space partitioning tends to work best with user input when you're usually not quite sure what you're going to get. If you're writing a multi-line list app, you're going to want to check different white space characters. Users could post, copy and paste text into your app if you allow them to. Be aware of that. They could bring in all kinds of garbage. And you don't want to try and, say, parse that text or format that text, come across something that uh, you haven't written for and crash your app. So just be aware of that. This is, works well for um, input space testing. There are frameworks that help with this. Swift check and quick check. Well, quick check was originally written. See, Tim gets it. Um, quick check um, was originally written in Haskell, and it is a combinatorial input generator. So you can say, here is my uh, an array. It's an array of integers. Um, I want you to generate various arrays of various sizes with various different integers in it. And then I want you to sort that array. And then it checks. So what quick check or swift check in this case will do is it will 
generate a bunch of numbers and a bunch of arrays, put them in there, run it a thousand or so times, and give you a result. That's great. What's really cool is it will do shrinking. Say, for example, my array sort algorithm doesn't like prime numbers, right? Because it's a really funky implementation of a sort. What Swift check will do is it will tell you, okay, this works for all of these, but these it doesn't. It will narrow down what your possible input space is. Say there's one number that your sort doesn't like. It will get to it and it will say, okay, this is failing for odd numbers, for primes or for... It gives you a, an output that shows um, that this fails due to this possible minimal case. Uh, this will do this for strings, for arrays, for even custom type objects, which I'm still trying to get work. I will post something when I do get it to work. But you can say, here's my custom type with my custom object. See how my custom type reacts to my custom object. I'll let you know when I get that working. But that's really cool. Um, and it's, it's working in Swift, which is good, very, very good. Some of the other frameworks I mentioned later don't. So state testing, oh, and I'll get to the reasons why later. So state testing, you have a stable state. You have a precondition. And you have a transition, which results in a post condition and a post stable state. So when I mention games, uh, you're going to want to check how the user moves between each of your states. In this case, um, storyboards are a great place to start. You've got a massive view hierarchy, all linked by segues. They're a great place to apply some testing. Because a segue can pull data from one view and push it into another, it can cause a transition to happen between, it can do asynchronous data calls. There are all these things that, that can happen in that transition. You want to be sure that it is successful and that your view looks correct in the end, or a certain user interaction causes a certain uh, output to occur. Data processing is another good example of a state-based transition. You may pull some data in from a, from a service, and then it goes through a pipeline of being transformed into data that your app can use. So along each of those steps, you can seed uh, known data in at one end and make sure that a known data comes out at the other end. And this is good for I.O. as well. So um, user input, input from web services, responses back from servers, um, touch input with the new Apple um, UI kit testing, really, really great. So some of the things that can help you do some state-based testing. Stubbing. So stubbing is the process of swapping out one object or uh, certain methods of an object with pre-prepared responses. This works really well for testing against web services. Um, and it uses method swizzling. This is an object C runtime uh, ability where you take the message conveyed to one object and you, you swap it out. So let's get some code. It's probably easier to explain. So OHHTTPS stubs is a great framework for stubbing web services. So say you're 30,000 feet in the air and you want to test the web service that your app is talking to. You don't need to be connected to the internet. You don't need to run a local server. You don't have to have your own fake implementation of the web service. What this is doing here is this is taking a uh, request that should be sent to api.timrafile.com, and it will stub the response. And it's going to return back an NS data block that says API test call with a status code 204. So, Given a certain URL, you can swap out the NSURL session and NSURL connection that responds. So what this is doing at runtime is it recognizes that this request is going to api.timrafile.com and it is um, swapping out the implementation and feeding back some false data. This way you can set up certain responses from your web service and make sure that your app will respond to them accordingly. 
check out your web service that you're using, look at all the different response codes that that web service is capable of giving, and write your tests against that. Um, it will do NS data. It will also do um, file-based requests. So in this case, I'm passing back a JSON file, um, which if you use something like parse, um, you get a JSON-style response. Really, really useful. Um, you can set the header type as well. So if you've got custom, um, if you've got a custom web service, uh, you can add a bunch of that stuff as well. The other cool thing is you can test this under different network speeds, different losses. So if you're on a very, very congested 3G or Wi-Fi network and you're getting 5% packet loss, that's pretty much guaranteed to kill a connection. Even 1% packet loss is enough to kill uh, a connection or at least really, really slow it down. So see how your app responds under that. If you're streaming data from WebSockets or something like that, really, really good to test. Um, you can also check when there's no network. So you can set this up, say, okay, don't get a response or get a, an error response back saying network's down. Check your app under those conditions because in the real world, we all know 3G is dodgy and patchy and users move from Wi-Fi to 3G and that's not necessarily a perfect transition. You want to see how your app responds under those conditions. Now, when you're stubbing uh, NSDRL connection, NSDRL session responses, um, you've got to make sure you do some cleaning up because at runtime, it will uh, swap out these methods when it sees your API calls. Um, and if you happen to run something, if you're writing this in your non-test code, then please don't ship it because you'll get some really weird stuff happening. Um, you basically need to clean up in between times. So when in your teardown for XE test, um, make sure you do remove all stubs and it will remove or anything you've stubbed previously, and then you'll be talking direct to NSUR session and NSUR connection and out to the web again. Otherwise, yeah, you, you're going to get burnt. I've done this. I spent an hour and a half wondering why I was getting a 405 response for something that I should have been getting a 204 response for. Yeah, for me. Um, mocking is the next thing I want to talk about. These are dumb, empty classes that are meant to imitate something else. It should have been a different picture, but I like this one. Um, so what I've done here is I've written a mock database class. So let's pretend I've written a database class. Um, and the database class takes a number for request. Uh, so my request, and it returns a response. So my database request. Notice the request parameter is my database request, not mock my database request. This actually takes a real database request and mocks the response. Now this is great. This would probably work. Um, it's a bit more code for me, so I've got to duplicate the API, the public API of my existing class. And so when I update my existing class, I need to update my mock class, and I've got to make sure they're the same. That's a lot of work. Um, so there is another way. OC mock. So OC mock is great. It'll take an existing class and it will pretend. It will use the public API of that class and it'll let you interact with it. So in this case, I'm actually stubbing NS user defaults. Ah, oh, okay. Mocking is very similar to stubbing. So stubbing, you can stub individual methods and get responses back. Mocking, you can mock whole objects. You can also stub whole objects, but they're slightly different concepts. In this case, I'm mocking NS user defaults. Um, so say you're testing a settings panel within your app, or you're checking how your app sets settings or retrieves settings. This way, you don't have to muck around with NS user defaults as part of your test. Uh, when your app or your client calls NS user defaults, you can make sure that given a certain string, it sends back another string. So the magic is in the last line, but with a bit of setup, we've got uh, OCM class mock NS user defaults. So we're saying mock NS user defaults. And then I'm saying string for key. So given a key, give me back this string exactly as you would with any NS user defaults interaction. And then lastly, OCM stub pretend defaults mock, which actually gives me access to the NS user defaults API. So when my app calls standard user defaults, it returns back my NS user defaults mock. Really useful, again, for, for settings and, and anything. But if you've got 
existing classes that you want to mock, say my database class, uh, you can do exactly the same thing. A um, few other points. Code coverage. Now, this is new in Xcode 7. Um, I'm not decided on this code coverage report as yet. Um, it's useful because it counts the number of times one of your methods is called under test. Okay, that's, that's cool. I, all my methods are called under test. Great, they must be tested. Well, no, they're not. Um, if you've got a method with five or six different parameters, those different parameters can have different valid values. It doesn't mean your app treats them accordingly. So just because you've got 100% coverage on some class within your app doesn't mean it's, it's tested well. So you've got to be aware of the inputs, the outputs, and everything that happens in between. <laughs> so these are some of the, these are the frameworks that I mentioned. Um, I've got a little bit of time, but I haven't prepared any uh, test slides, but I'll go through some, uh, I'll go through some test-driven development stuff. Um, actually, I might be able to pull up. Give me a minute. This is a framework called Expector. Now, as you might expect, um, it, it is intending to get you to write uh, test cases that you expect to implement. So it has a bunch of um, matches for testing things, but there is a really good example here. Okay, so basically what it allows you to do is to say, okay, I expect to have a model object called my model. I expect that model object to have a member called, I don't know, initial value. I expect initial value when the object is created to be false. That's your syntax for the test. So you run the test, it fails. Okay, you then go and write your model object. You write your model object and you call it my model object. You then write that initial, initial value and you make sure that in your init function, you make it with the value false. You run the test, your test passes. You continue through adding methods and anything that makes sense to have in that class, you write the test for it. If writing the test doesn't feel right, either architecturally or design-wise, it doesn't hmm, this doesn't quite fit, you, you change the test, and that will then force you to change your implementation. Give it a shot. Um, Expect is really great. Um, once you get into it and get your head around some of the keywords and stuff, it adds. Um, it's still in Objective-C, uh, so they've started doing some Swift-type stuff on it. Um, I'm still not convinced yet. The Objective-C stuff works really well. Um, but yeah, it's... As an exercise, give it a try. You might like it, you might not, but it's definitely worth it. If you're looking for something different, do it. At this point, I've now got nearly the end of my time. Has anybody got any questions? Thank you very much, everyone. Um, some really great questions.